Welcome to this session on ECCE educators and caregivers that I'm honored to chair. Today, we will have the opportunity to discuss about key policy levers required to foster quality, competences, and better professional status of ECCE personnel at global level. The agenda of our session is structured around two segments. The first is dedicated to a panel segment, which will be moderated by Alette Van Leeuw, Director of Sectoral Policies, International Labor Organization. And the second is the national statement segment, which I myself will facilitate. During the first segment, we will start with a keynote speech from Professor Sharon Lynn Kagan to frame our discussion. Then we will hear from ministers during a panel discussion where they will have the opportunity to address some key questions related to the theme of this session as well as share their experiences. This discussion will also benefit from insights from partners. After this panel discussion, I will open the floor for national statements from delegates of member states. I'm now delighted to give the floor to Ms. Alid Van Leeuw to moderate the session. Your Excellency, Ms. Dipumoni Navas, Minister of Education of Bangladesh, thank you so much for allowing me to moderate this uh, meaningful discussion on the workforce, the, uh, the uh, early childhood education workforce. And dear excellencies, dear delegates, dear participants, uh, a warm welcome to you all. Education starts early. This is what we have heard throughout this conference and we in the International Labour Organization consider early childhood education and development essential for building the healthy, productive workforce of the future. Early childhood care and education personnel are pivotal in ensuring quality services and ECE requires a professional, qualified workforce. The early childhood workforce are workers and all workers around the world have the right to decent work. This is the mandate of the International Labour Organization and I'm therefore honored to moderate this high-level plenary session here with you. It's now my pleasure and my honor to have today with us Ms. Sharon Lynn Kagan, who is the Virginia and Le Leonard Marx Professor of Early Childhood and Family Policy and co-director of the National Center for Children and Families at Teachers College, Columbia University. And also professor adjunct at Yale University's Child Study Center. And she will tell us about the situation of ECC educators and caregivers and focusing on key issues affecting them in many parts of the world and ways to respond to those critical issues. Professor Lynn Kagan, you now have the floor. Uh, there should be a PowerPoint. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, to our gracious hosts, to our honorable delegates, and to our treasured colleagues, thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you about the early childhood care and education workforce. To do so, 
I am going to discuss who it actually is, what major challenges it faces, how many countries around the world are addressing these challenges, and where we should focus next. <laughs> to begin, who is the early ECCE workforce? Well, we know that there are many, many people who care about young children, policemen, firemen, but a subset of those who care are the people who are paid to care for and educate young children and who support their parents on a regular basis. This is the definition that I indeed will use. Now, we know a lot about this workforce. It's big, about 9 million people globally. It's predominantly female, about 97%. It is very stressed. It is overworked, it is often underpaid, and it is especially vulnerable to many risks, COVID included, but economic and political shifts as well. And finally, this workforce matters. You and I know that the quality of any institution, a great university, a large business or industry, wonderful NGOs, and philanthropic organizations is primarily predicated on one thing, and that is the quality of its workforce. With regard to ECCE, the data are very clear. Staff qualifications predict high quality, cognitive, social, and language outcomes. But we also know something else. We know this workforce faces many challenges that we need to address if indeed it is to live up to its potential. I to go back. I'm going to discuss four. The first is the lack of supply. We know that our pleasant supply of workforce representatives is not able to provide services for all the children whom indeed we would like to serve. In fact, 40% of the world's children have no access in part due to the lack of providers. But we also know that we have another problem. Those who work in early childhood often leave the system so that we have globally a turnover rate of early childhood workers at about 40%. Nobody could run a corporation and industry with that kind of turnover. And indeed, as we've heard several times during this wonderful conference, if we are to meet the ambitious goals of 4.2, we need to double the supply of our workforce. So supply is a huge problem. But the second problem is a lack of quality. 40% of those in low-income countries are inadequately prepared and do not meet the minimum entry qualifications for our field. And once people are in our field, they also lack opportunities for advancement in terms of inadequate supervision, a lack of in-service training, a lack of coaching, and a lack of career ladders that prevent, present opportunities for them. Moreover, around the world, many countries are not collecting data, so it is very, very hard to know the status of the workforce. A third challenge is the lack of equity that we face. We all know that children have limited access, often predicated on their income, but this is compounded because poor children often have inadequate access to engaged adults and to adults who are well prepared to meet their needs. Similarly, children who live in rural areas are challenged by the lack of an adequate workforce. And finally, gender inequities prevail in our field. We are obviously highly genderized. The final commitment is one that many of us have been speaking about. 
it is the lack of supports. And supports come in very different ways. Our basic compensation rates are very limited, as those who work with young children are paid only 74% as to their equivalently educated workforce. We have limited funding for scholarships and for fellowships so that quality in-service training is a barrier. And finally, another form of support is that we have limited recognition of our field. In fact, in a major European country very recently, a survey indicated that 90% of the staff in ECCE reported that early childhood and their work was not respected or valued. It's very hard to make social change when indeed that lack of recognition prevails. And if all of that weren't enough, we face challenges due to climate change, to globalization, to technology, to vast changes in the population, and to urbanization. So we see that we have a field that is very important, but very, very challenged. Now, how are countries beginning to address these challenges? Let me take each challenge in turn based upon a study that we have done as well as research collected from around the world. The first problem, the problem of supply. And I know that there are wonderful examples worldwide. We've heard of many of them during this conference, so I'm just going to pick a few. In Norway, they have enlisted a campaign that says the best job in the world is vacant. They are actively recruiting individuals. Indeed, we have uh, in Tanzania, there is a national program to train existing primary school teachers for work in early childhood. And in the United States, the well-known Teach Fellowship Program not only provides scholarships for individuals, but insists that once those individuals are placed, they indeed earn appropriate compensation. Quality and equity. There are many examples of this. In Sweden, we have a government-funded teacher salary boost program that really rewards people who are working and doing a very good job with young children. Australia is a wonderful example of, indeed, a country that has done a very good job in helping to ensure basic compensation by providing minimum wages and by supporting the unionization of individuals. And indeed, the European Union has done a wonderful job of approaching innovative teaching with an award that is given annually. So we see that around the world, there are very, very important supports that are being rendered. Now, all of us cannot implement all of these, nor is that appropriate. But there are two things that we indeed can do right now. And I would like to submit that the first is that we need to think about our work a little bit differently. And the second is that we need to act very wisely and very, very inclusively. Let me elaborate. I'd like to suggest that we need to think differently about two different things. The first is infrastructure. You know that when you and I talk to governments and they say infrastructure, they usually mean buildings and facilities, correct? Yes, correct. Um, but that's not the only kind of infrastructure there is. When we are dealing with the workforce, there is an infrastructure that relates to not only money and compensation, but we need certificate programs. We need professional institutions of higher education. We need career ladders that mark pathways. I would like to suggest that the early ECC workforce is badly in need of a different kind of infrastructure and that we indeed should be talking about that and thinking about supporting that infrastructure dramatically. The second different think really relates to what our roles of government are. And we have heard a lot of commitment to government's role as a provider of resources. And clearly, that is important. 
But I would like to point out, and we heard this just moments ago from the wonderful examples, that indeed governments have important roles in terms of stewardship and leadership. And this is very, very important. Governments are the ones who safeguard supply, quality, and equity as they promulgate standards, as they foster implementation, as they monitor what indeed we are doing, and as they provide incentives for others to become involved. I would suggest that we need to have our think considering the government role as one of funder and steward of excellent ECCE. Now, if we want to, oopsie, I don't want to go there, I need to go back. <laughs> if we want to do all of this, we need to act wisely and inclusively. We've heard a lot about that. The first is that we must learn lessons from other countries and from others and adapt them to fit our own context. Examples are prevalent. Equally important, we must make the workforce a priority. We must sound loud and clearly the need for focusing on the workforce because of its essential role in supporting young children. You know, everyone, we can do this. A decade ago, when we were in Moscow, we didn't have anywhere near the kind of representation that we do from ministers and from high-level delegates. Indeed, in this decade, we have accomplished a great deal. We have been very successful in shouting out the centrality of ECCE to country advancement. I would like to suggest that for the next date, with equal vigor, we need to proclaim the centrality of the ECCE workforce to our overall agenda. Finally, I would like to say that often we learn the most important lessons from children. Four-year-old Tanika is a Head Start child, and like us, she was very challenged. She wanted to paint, but she was uncertain about how to go about doing it. So, like us, she looked at others, she thought about it a great deal, and one day, as she approached the easel, I overheard her muttering, I think I can, I think I can. Painting is actually easy. All you have to do is first think your thoughts, and then you need to paint your think. This from a four-year-old child. I would like to suggest that through the generous sponsorship of Uzbekistan and UNESCO and all of their partners, we are thinking our thoughts about our workforce. Now, what we are being charged to do is what young children do every single day of their lives. We need to challenge ourselves to paint a beautiful think that prioritizes the early childhood care and education workforce. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much, Sharon Lynn. Uh, thank you for your keynote speech and your valuable, valuable inputs into the discussion on uh, ECC educators and caregivers. And this was a really inspiring start of our conversation. You mentioned that uh, the workforce should be made a priority and also the workforce should be central to our overall agenda. And of course, we in ILO like that very much. Thank you for those comments. Um, in the meantime, we have been joined now, uh, and I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, we are honored to have with us uh, the presence of Her Excellency, Ms. Dedeu Usman Sidibe, Minister of National Education of Mali. Bienvenue, madame. Um, I would like to call on Ms. Uh, Savia, uh, Minister of Social Action, Childhood, and family of Mauritania to join us here on the podium. Um, and also we have with us Her Excellency Marie-Michelle Sahondra Malala, Minister of National Education of the Republic of Madagascar. 
Your Excellencies, you're most welcome. And again, I would like to call on the Minister of Social Action, Childhood and Family of Mauritania to join us here on the podium if you are here with us in the room, and that is Ms. Savia Ntaha uh, of Mauritania. We also have with us here on the podium Ms. Nafisa Sekova, the Global Lead for Education and Early Childhood Development of the Aga Khan Foundation. And we'll give her the floor uh, in a short while. And also we have with us on the podium Mr. Dennis Signolo, who is representing the General Secretary of Education International. And he will also speak afterwards. Um, while waiting for, yes, I believe that the Minister of Mauritania is going to join us. But I would first now like to call on Your Excellency, Ms. Dedewu Usman Sidibe, Minister of National Education of Mali, to take the floor for the next five minutes. And I would like to ask you uh, for what is the, uh, to present the key levers regarding ensuring quality continuous professional development of ECC staff and to share some examples of successful actions that uh, Mali has developed. So without any further ado, Madame Dedeu Usman Sidebe, Minister of National Education of Mali, you have the floor. Okay. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame la Moderatrice. Uh, Bonjour à la, à la présidente et au vice-président, à la représentante de la présidente, et, chers collègues. Je vais, Madame la modératrice, merci de m'avoir donné la parole. Avant de répondre à votre question, je vais d'abord vous parler un peu du contexte de l'école malienne aujourd'hui. Nous avons connu au Mali une crise sociopolitique sans précédent. Et ce, depuis mars 2012, ce qui a aggravé l'état des lieux en ce qui concerne un système éducatif déjà très affecté. Les conséquences de ces événements se sont traduites par un déplacement massif des enseignants et aussi des élèves. Et en même temps, il y a eu la destruction des infrastructures et des équipements. Donc, dans six régions du Mali affectées par la crise, nous avons au total, hélas, aujourd'hui, près de 800 écoles qui sont fermées sur 4690 au mois de novembre 2018. Et en plus de ces écoles, il y a aussi des centres de développement de la petite enfance qui, malheureusement, sont fermés. Donc, Pour ce qui est des actions menées par le gouvernement du Mali, nous avons une politique nationale, une politique nationale de développement de la petite enfance, qui est déclinée dans un programme qu'on appelle le programme décennal de l'éducation et de la formation professionnelle, qui consiste surtout à mettre l'accent tout d'abord sur la scolarisation des filles, l'identification et la réinsertion des enfants hors école parce que nous avons un bon nombre à travers des alternatives et la réinsertion directe des enfants hors école. Nous avons, pour venir en venir à votre question, un renforcement de capacité des enseignants, des directeurs d'école, des conseillers pédagogiques, etc. Et ceci autour de la mobilisation des communautés et surtout des associations spécifiques qu'on appelle des associations des mères d'élèves. Il y a aussi les comités de gestion scolaire, mais la formation et le, le rôle de ces comités de gestion scolaire à la conception répondent à un projet, projet accompagné par un plan d'action. Donc, de la prise en compte de l'éducation inclusive, surtout dans la formation des instituts de formation des maîtres, nous, nous constatons qu'il y a des avancées et une motivation qui fait que 
nous pouvons mobiliser autour du personnel qui est dédié à cette éducation, surtout dans le domaine préscolaire. Je m'en vais dire qu'avec la volonté politique qui se manifeste surtout au niveau du gouvernement malien par la prise en compte de l'éducation pour tous et aussi dans les ODD4. Ensuite, nous avons l'existence de ce document de politique nationale qui se décline en trois approches. Nous avons une approche droit, tout enfant a droit à l'éducation, une approche holistique et intégrée, donc une approche globale et aussi une approche communautaire. Communautaire, c'est très important dans le contexte malien parce que ça nécessite la mobilisation autour de l'école, des parents, des familles, des collectivités pour la prise en charge du jeune enfant. Ce qui nous a conduit à créer avec les partenaires des structures alternatives de développement de la petite enfance dans nos communautés rurales et aussi dans nos quartiers périphériques pour prendre en charge les enfants d'âge préscolaire. Donc nous avons une direction nationale qui est dédiée à l'éducation préscolaire et aussi à l'éducation spéciale parce que la prise en compte dans le cadre de l'inclusion des enfants vivant avec handicap est aussi une priorité. Pour la première fois au Mali, nous avons assisté à une procédure mise en place par des spécialistes qui nous ont permis de faire passer les examens du baccalauréat au BEPC avec, pour des enfants handicapés qui vivent avec un handicap moteur. Donc ça, c'est une, une première au Mali et c'est important. Mais nous avons aussi des difficultés, les difficultés qui euh, s'inclinent, qui s'expliquent par le faible taux du budget alloué au sous-secteur, l'écart entre le milieu urbain et le milieu rural, à cause de l'insécurité, à cause du terrorisme que vit le Mali aujourd'hui, il y a eu un déplacement massif des populations des zones rurales vers les zones urbaines, ce qui rend difficile la scolarisation des enfants surtout à bas âge, qui se déplacent avec leurs parents. Mais des moyens sont mis en œuvre pour permettre à ces enfants, soit souvent nous utilisons, comme je vous l'ai dit, les mères éducatrices, souvent il y a aussi des, de, de, des moyens dématérialisés qui permettent aux enfants de pouvoir être dans les familles, mais dans des classes. Donc la fermeture de ces écoles-là par le, le, le terrorisme nous a vraiment handicapés. Donc, euh, autre, autre, voilà aujourd'hui le tableau qui n'est pas reluisant, mais qui rejoint ce qui se passe dans beaucoup d'autres pays. Mais je pense que lors de cette conférence, nous avons bon espoir parce que la mobilisation et la mutualisation des moyens et des expériences pourront nous permettre d'en de, venir, de venir à bout de ça. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much for describing the situation in Mali and also informing us about your national policy and how important it is to ensure that um, the policy is inclusive, including um, groups of children, including disabled children, but also um, you spoke about the urbanization that's going on in Mali at the moment and that uh, we also need to take into account the urban areas uh, to make sure that uh, there's access to early childhood education also in, urban, in, in rural areas. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Savian Taha, Minister of Social Action, Childhood and Family of Mauritania, to present also in the next five minutes your national perspective regarding key levers for ensuring quality continuous professional development of ECE staff and also to share some uh, examples of your successful actions in Mauritania. Madame Savia Nata, you have the floor.
Tout d'abord, euh, je tiens à remercier le gouvernement de l'Ouzbékistan pour l'accueil chaleureux et particulièrement le ministère du préscolaire de l'Ouzbékistan, sans oublier l'UNESCO euh, de m'avoir invité à cette importante conférence internationale. Je J'en profite pour euh, vous présenter le cas de la Mauritanie. Euh, L'éducation préscolaire et la protection des jeunes enfants au cœur des priorités de développement de la Mauritanie. Un engagement fort pour accélérer la réalisation de la cible 4 des objectifs de développement durable. Une volonté politique de plus en plus affichée pour le développement de la petite enfance. La Mauritanie s'est dotée en 2005 d'une politique nationale de développement de la petite enfance avec pour objectif principal donner aux jeunes enfants un bon départ dans la vie, création d'un centre de formation pour la petite enfance, formation de personnel d'encadrement de la petite enfance, adoption en 2006 d'une ordonnance 048-2006 qui définit les modes d'éducation et de garde des jeunes enfants, création en 2008 d'un ministère chargé, entre autres, de l'enfance, avec quatre entités techniques spécifiquement consacrées à la petite enfance, direction de l'enfance, direction de la famille, programme national de nutrition et cellules, de lutte contre les mutilations génitales féminines, élaboration en 2010, puis réactualisation en 2016, d'une stratégie nationale de protection de l'enfance, actuellement en cours de mise en œuvre. Mon pays a élaboré et met en œuvre une stratégie nationale pour la croissance accélérée et de partage de la prospérité qui couvre la période 2016-2030. L'objectif prioritaire défini par cette stratégie dans le domaine est de contribuer au développement du jeune enfant à travers un encadrement familial et une éducation préscolaire de qualité par l'amélioration de la qualité et de la quantité des services du préscolaire. Un ambitieux plan stratégique pour l'accélération de l'extension de l'offre des services et une augmentation de l'investissement. Fort de l'engagement, son, en, son Excellence Monsieur le Président de la République, relatif à la création d'une offre préscolaire au profit de 100 000 enfants de la tranche d'âge 3 à 6 ans, à l'horizon 2024. Sur la base des projections démographiques qui font état de plus de 250 000 enfants de la tranche d'âge, préscolarisation 3 à 6 ans, partant du faible taux de préscolarisation actuel à peine 10 l'existence d'un ensemble d'opportunités, nous avons élaboré un plan stratégique pour l'accélération du développement d'un système d'éducation préscolaire de qualité centrée dans la sphère des pauvres. Ce plan stratégique est fondé sur des approches innovantes. Notre objectif est d'opérer une refondation du système actuel 10 en vue de porter le taux de préscolarisation des jeunes enfants à 40 l'année scolaire 2024-2025. Mise en place d'une commission à cet effet, nous avons mis en place une commission nationale multisectorielle chargée de l'élaboration d'un plan stratégique de l'accélération du développement du préscolaire durant la période 2022-2025. Un plan stratégique fondé sur l'exploitation du potentiel existant d'opportunités et sur un partenariat multipartite. Les axes du plan stratégique sont 1. La gouvernance et le suivi du sous-secteur du préscolaire en l'intégrant au système national d'information pour la gestion de l'éducation, nommé SIGE. 2. Éducation parentale pour améliorer les capacités des parents et renforcer leur rôle. 3. Renforcement de l'offre du préscolaire au profit des ménages d'extrême vulnérabilité. 4. Partenariat public-privé pour assurer annuellement 15 000 places au profit des enfants de la classe moyenne et des ménages vulnérables. 5. Partenariat public communautaire par la mise à contribution des écoles d'enseignement coranique et autres initiatives communautaires. 6. Formation des ressources humaines qualifiées, approche à moindre coût, y compris le personnel d'inspection et de contrôle de normes et de la qualité. 7. Nutrition et santé des jeunes enfants, suivi et prise en charge. 
Dans ce cadre, nous avons élaboré un système de partenariat multipartie par le développement du programme scolaire. Signature d'une convention de partenariat multipartie qui définit les rôles et responsabilités de chacune des parties prenantes. Les parties prenantes au niveau national sont les ministères de l'Action sociale de l'enfance et de la famille, le ministère de l'Éducation nationale et de la réforme du système éducatif, le ministère des Affaires islamiques et de l'enseignement originel, la délégation générale de la solidarité nationale et pour la lutte contre l'exclusion, la commission à la sécurité alimentaire, l'association des maires de Mauritanie. Nos orientations sont focalisées sur les principaux avantages suivants que nous offre l'éducation préscolaire et la protection des jeunes enfants, une bonne préparation de l'enfant à l'école et à la mahadra, une socialisation de l'enfant qui contribue au renforcement de la cohésion sociale et de l'unité nationale, une contribution à l'autonomisation de la femme et de la fille, plus de temps de production pour la femme, rétention scolaire de la fille. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. And thank you so much, Madam Minister. Uh, thank you for sharing your, uh, also the challenges that your country, Mauritania, is faced with, but also sharing your commitments. You have very ambitious uh, commitments for the preschool education systems, and I think uh, uh, these are excellent ideas, the national education centers uh, focusing on teachers, but particularly I heard you say uh, involving the parents, which is absolutely so crucial. Um, so thank you for sharing those experiences with us. Um, now, I would like to call on Ms. Marie-Michelle Sahondrari Malala. I always uh, am a, a big fan of the names in Madagascar. They are <laughs> kind of long, but beautiful. Uh, the Minister of Education of Madagascar, to hear from you what your experiences are, your national perspectives, and also um, uh, focusing on ECC staff pre-service preparation and further development. Thank you. You have the floor, Madam Minister. Merci. Uh, Madame la Présidente, uh, Monsieur le Vice-Président, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, uh, bonjour. Uh, premièrement, uh, félicitations à la République de l'Ouzbékistan et à l'UNESCO pour la qualité de l'organisation et la pertinence tenant uh, à l'éducation infantile et à la petite enfance. En ce qui concerne Madagascar, l'éducation préscolaire à un fondement communautaire fait partie de l'éducation non formelle et bénéficie d'un ancrage institutionnel, organisationnel, avec des responsables préscolaires à tous les niveaux de l'administration. Nous disposons de, de documents cadres et de textes sur le régime général de l'école infantile et aujourd'hui, la majorité des centres préscolaires sont gérés par l'État. Nous avons pu développer les structures préscolaires sur une relation triangulaire entre trois groupes d'acteurs. Premièrement, les communautés de base par la création de centres d'apprentissage préscolaire ou CAP et d'espaces d'éveil communautaire ou EEC dans les zones rurales. Par la construction de salles rustiques dotation de terrain, sécurisation de l'espace, mise à disposition d'éducateurs et d'animateurs. Ensuite, le deuxième groupe, constitué par les collectivités territoriales décentralisées, les sociétés privées dans le cadre de la responsabilité sociétale des entreprises, les ONG, les PTF, par la construction d'infrastructures. Et enfin, le troisième groupe, par l'État, par le rattachement des centres d'apprentissage préscolaire dans les écoles primaires publiques, la création systématique de classes préscolaires dans les nouvelles écoles publiques aux normes dans les zones urbaines, par l'appui financier au démarrage des écoles d'éveil communautaire, la dotation de kits scolaires, d'outils pédagogiques, de tables bancs à travers les subventions octroyées aux éducateurs animateurs, dotation de caisses écoles pour les établissements publics, de cantines scolaires aux préscolaires et encore plus par la mise en place d'une usine de production de solutions nutritionnelles pour les enfants préscolarisés. Mais les écoles privées ont également contribué à améliorer l'accès à la préscolarisation. Et ce qui nous a permis d'avoir aujourd'hui les résultats suivants, 
on a aujourd'hui 42,49 de taux de préscolarisation, avec 65 issus des écoles publiques. 16 232 écoles primaires publiques sont aujourd'hui dotées de préscolaires, dont 72 dans les zones rurales. On a mis en place 610 écoles d'éveil communautaire et 390 espaces d'éveil communautaire sont en cours de mise en place actuellement. On a 45 de centres préscolaires dotés de kits scolaires et d'outils pédagogiques et on a pu respecter un ratio de 25 enfants par éducateur dans les centres préscolaires publics. Mais qu'en est-il des éducateurs préscolaires Aujourd'hui, ils sont au nombre de 33 348 éducateurs préscolaires contre 90 000 au niveau primaire. Ils sont munis pour la plupart d'un diplôme de brevet, en majorité non fonctionnaires, rémunérés avec les cotisations parentales, ne percevant pas de salaire pendant les grandes vacances, obligés de trouver un deuxième emploi. Et 65 ont quand même pu bénéficier d'une formation d'initiation de 10 jours par les formateurs spécialisés en EPP, eux, avant d'enseigner. Ce qui nous a incité à développer et à expérimenter un programme éducatif préscolaire, offrir une formation continue pour 18 467 éducateurs préscolaires, expérimenter une formation initiale pour 100 éducateurs préscolaires depuis 2020, agréer des associations privées, des centres privés pour la formation en éducation préscolaire et en éducation inclusive, instaurer un dispositif de suivi encadrement pédagogique de 1 500 éducateurs préscolaires jusqu'à aujourd'hui pour renforcer leurs compétences en matière de gestion de classe, de fabrication de matériel didactique. Et commencer à recruter en tant que fonctionnaire en trois ans 31 500 enseignants dans 3 950 éducateurs préscolaires issus des écoles publiques selon les critères d'ancienneté, niveau académique, de qualification professionnelle. Nous avons aussi recruté en tant que fonctionnaires des éducateurs préscolaires des centres privés de prise en charge des enfants en situation de handicap gérés par les parents et subventionné 2 714 enseignants non fonctionnaires préscolaires à hauteur de 51,33 dollars par enseignant tous les deux mois. Mais actuellement, il nous reste à opérationnaliser les journées pédagogiques, les réseaux des éducateurs préscolaires, à renforcer les compétences des directeurs d'école, des chefs de zone administratives pédagogiques, améliorer la collecte et la gestion de bases de données des éducateurs communautaires non fonctionnaires, multiplier les infirmerie scolaire et mettre en place une mutuelle de santé spéciale pour les enseignants d'une manière générale qui va inclure également les éducateurs préscolaires. Mais réfléchir surtout sur un dispositif de formation, de remise à niveau, un test de niveau à l'entrée et un concours de recrutement pour les éducateurs préscolaires. Aujourd'hui, nous avons soumis un projet de loi d'orientation sur le système éducatif devant le Parlement à Madagascar pour ce mois de novembre et qui va mettre en place une préscolarisation obligatoire d'une année, un enseignement gratuit progressif de 10 ans jusqu'à la fin du collège, intégrer la préscolarisation dans l'éducation formelle, encadrer les partenariats publics et privés dans l'éducation, mais surtout mettre en place aussi une politique linguistique d'enseignement dès le préscolaire, des curricula des programmes éducatifs et un calendrier scolaire flexible. Tout cela s'inscrit dans une logique d'unité et de continuité dans le système éducatif et est considéré la préscolarisation comme étant partie intégrante dans le système formel de l'éducation à Madagascar. Aujourd'hui, nous savons quoi faire, mais rien, rien ne nous empêche à avancer. Alors, nous incitons chaque pays à ne pas avoir peur pour garantir l'éducation à la préscolarisation de nos enfants. Merci. Thank you so much, Minister of Education of Madagascar. I heard you uh, mention and report back on quite a successful start of your pre-school uh, education system. 
with 42% of children covered already. But I also heard you mention that um, some of the preschool teachers are um, recruited through private providers and that their conditions of work are not adequate, um, not paid during the holidays, and that you're now addressing that and looking into uh, continuous learning uh, for professional development for them and also to uh, work towards better remuneration because this is essential if we, as we have agreed to retain these preschool teachers uh, for in the workforce of course. Um, thank you very much for those interesting uh, experiences. I now would like to invite Ms. Nafisa Shekova who is the global lead for education and early childhood development of the Aga Khan Foundation to take the floor and to particularly share good practices concerning the training of ECE educators and caregivers. And uh, I believe that you will also speak to uh, the measures you have taken for parents and informal caregivers and the professionalization of ECC personnel. Please, you have the floor. It works now? Yes. <laughs> um, Your Excellencies, distinguished panelists and distinguished guests, um, Salam Alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Uh, the Aga Khan Foundation has been promoting early childhood development for over 40 years. We currently support early childhood development in 15 countries and of course ECD workforce is a very important aspect of our work. We partner with government, civil society, organizations and development partners to develop professional development tools, resources, and strengthen the capacity of ECD workforce, which includes health workers, pre-primary educators, and social workers around early childhood development. Uh, today, I'd like to share three lessons and considerations uh, from our experience in supporting pre-primary education, because I only have five minutes. <laughs> I'll only be able to share three lessons focusing on the pre-primary educators. Number one, is the need to create diverse professional pathways. When our long-standing partner, the Madrasa Early Childhood Program, started establishing community-based preschools in some of the remote areas in East Africa, it's mainly young girls and sometimes boys with only primary educa education who were interested to become preschool teachers. The Madrasa program developed pre-service teacher training program that was delivered in an in-service mode over two years in which these trainees were also teaching. Practicing teaching with a strong mentoring support has been a key ingredient of their in-service model. The MECP approach not only developed qualified teachers, but at the same time provided quality learning experiences for the young children. The approach also demonstrated that how young women and men who have not been able to complete their formal education have the aptitude, attitude, and motivation to become high quality ECC teachers. These young people have secured employment, enhanced their social economic status and became role models in their communities. So as we further the professionalization of ECC workforce, we need to ensure that the needs of the most remote and marginalized communities are taken into consideration. And we should not forget that this extensive pool of young talent can provide diverse, should not forget about the extensive pool of talent and provide diverse professional pathways for inspiring ECC teachers in the future. Number two, the need to recognize prior knowledge and teaching experiences. In many countries, ECD has and continues being supported by civil society organization, philanthropies, and development partners. And a lot, and, and a lot of efforts have been made by these stakeholders in training and supporting the ECC workforce. Many governments around the world have only recently started to develop and ratify policies and finance the ECC space. While many of the existing teachers may not have the academic qualification demanded by the national policy, these teachers are the very reason there is a fertile ground for the government to now build. When the government of Uganda created academic pathways for ECC teachers and educators, many of the teachers trained by the Madrasa Early Childhood Program did not have the required academic qualification. The Madrasa Early Childhood Program partnered with the Ministry of Education in Uganda 
and Bugema University and developed a bridging course that allowed these teachers to take this course over a time during their holidays and receive the government recognized certificate. So as the professional reforms take hold, existing teachers' contribution to their communities, societies, and countries must be celebrated and their experience and expertise recognized. And number three, the need for partnership. We know that governments alone will not be able to achieve the ECD agenda. In Zanzibar, a well-coordinated partnership between the Ministry of Education, UNICEF, and the Madrasa Early Childhood Program over the last 10 years has increased access to pre-primary education from just from 30% in 2012 to almost 81% in 2022. The government through UNICEF support has been creating school-based classrooms and allocated rooms and teachers. The Madrasa Early Childhood Program has been supporting the government in capacity building of teachers and creating contextually relevant, playful learning environment. This example demonstrates the well-coordinated government civil society partnership that leverage and respect the diverse qualities and attributes of each other can lead to rapid positive impact and change, elevating the needs for continued partnership in the future to achieve the national ECD agenda. Thank you. I am impressed, Ms. Shikova. In less than five minutes, your three lessons, diverse professional pathways, need to recognize professional, prior professional experience and the need for partnership. Crystal clear, thank you so much for your intervention. So we go to our last speaker for now, and I'm sorry that we are rushing you so much, but there is really uh, not enough time. Um, there are so many interesting interventions, but we need to, of course, stick to the times uh, available. And this is Mr. Dennis Signolo, representing the Secretary General of Education International. Please take the floor, and we look forward to hearing your perspectives of, on ECE personnel. Dennis, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. For those who may not be aware, Education International is the global union organization of teachers. We represent over 32.5 million educators from early childhood to university. Colleagues, we all agree that teachers matter. They transform lives, the lives of young children in our classrooms every day. In fact, when teachers and young children interact in the classroom, a miracle happens. I would like to take a moment to go through just five key points, which I call the five policy levers for guaranteeing a professional, not a professional motivated and adequately supported teacher for our children. You may call it the five point plan. Plan number one, it's important to professionalize teaching in the ECE sector. How can we do this? We need to establish professional teaching standards. EI and UNESCO in 2019 adopted a document, a very important framework of professional teaching standards globally. And I was encouraged to hear the Director General of UNESCO this morning indicate that specific standards for early childhood will be developed next year. EI will be happy to contribute to that process. Second, to professionalize teaching in the sector, it's important to provide training to all the early childhood educators, induction into the profession, continuous professional development. I'm talking about lifelong, life-wide, and life-deep learning for our teachers. And then third, we can professionalize teaching by giving teachers the professional autonomy the trust and the respect they deserve every day. And then number two, ensure adequate and quality tools, teaching and learning resources for teachers. It's important that teachers have the necessary infrastructure, that they have the necessary resources to teach effectively. EI is carrying out a study on school infrastructure in Africa and the results are discouraging. We don't have adequate resources in our schools and it's even worse in early childhood. And then third, Ensure decent salaries and working conditions for EC teachers and early childhood education support personnel. This is critical because we want teachers not to focus on where they are going to get their next meal from, but we want to, them to focus on what they know how to do best to teach. So it's important to improve salaries and to make sure that the salaries of teachers in early childhood education are no less than those of primary school teachers or educators in other sectors. And then number four, 
ensure the involvement of early childhood educators through their unions in institutionalized, genuine, and continuous social and policy dialogue. That is continuous engagement protected by legislation and done in good faith. And number five, which is the last lever, governments should commit to invest in early childhood education and in early childhood educators. This is critical, right from zero to eight. That's why the Tashkent Declaration must have clear benchmarks for domestic financing of education and certainly for development aid as well. That's why our governments must respect the commitment to meet at least 6% of GDP or at least 20% of the national budget allocation to education for developing countries. I would like also to encourage development aid partners to meet their commitment to invest 0.7% of gross national income to development aid and make sure that at least 20% of all development aid goes to education and that includes early childhood education. In conclusion, I would like to stress, Madam Chair, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the critical importance of government leadership and action. Yes, civil society can do something. Yes, others can do something. But the real game changer is government commitment, political leadership, investment in early childhood education and teachers. I'm talking about public investment and public provision of early childhood education. It is therefore important that we guarantee a qualified and motivated teacher for every child. If we do that, that would be the real game changer. That would be the real ambition of this very important conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. On behalf of Education International, um, crystal clear uh, five-point plan. And um, the last point is particularly important in this context also. Governments take charge. This is uh, the real game changer. Show your political commitment to ensure um, quality childhood education. This is your role and your commitment. Thank you so much for this really, really interesting debate. Unfortunately, we do not have more time to discuss. I think we had a very, very rich overview of various government experiences. Uh, also, partners have shared their experiences and, and good practices. And we are now, have now, uh, are coming to the end of this discussion. And I would now like to hand back to Her Excellency Ms. Dipo Moni Nawaz of Bangladesh to take over as president of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Aled Van Leeuw, for moderating the panel discussion today. It is now time to open the floor for national statements from delegates of member states. We already have speakers registered for this session. Therefore, delegates who are not on the list are kindly requested to register to the speaking list during tomorrow's high-level session four. This is due to time constraints and a packed agenda with no margin for delays. I thank you in advance for your kind cooperation. I now ask the Secretariat to read out the list of speakers. Thank you, President, for giving me the floor. We have uh, seven member states who have registered for this session. Azerbaijan in person, Romania video, DPR Korea in person, Yemen in person, Germany in person, Tajikistan a video and Sri Lanka a video. Thank you. Um, delegates may take the floor only once and each intervention is limited to two minutes. Kindly ensure that you respect the time limit as we are already running very late. I will now uh, give the floor to the first speaker, the representative of Azerbaijan. Uh, if the representative is not in the room, then I'll give the then uh, the speaker from Romania who will uh, deliver a speech on video, a video speech.
Romania strongly believes that early childhood education and care lie at the foundation of all future education levels and participation in lifelong learning. Inclusive and high-quality early childhood education and care have a significant impact on addressing inequity and social exclusion. The Educated Romania project under implementation at the national level contains a series of strategic objectives, among them the development of a network of public nurseries, kindergartens and other preschool and early childhood education services that will gradually allow the general inclusion of children in early childhood education. We are closely working with the local authorities to increase the capacity of the education system through investment in infrastructure and the construction of more than 100 energy efficient nurseries and over 400 complementary facilities such as children's daycare, play centers and toy libraries. A new curriculum of early education of children from birth to six years was approved in 2019, offering development opportunities to all children regardless of gender, ethnicity, religion or socio-economic status and aiming to develop pro-social, accepting and respectful behaviors toward diversity. There is no doubt that the quality of early education is highly dependent on the professionalism, competence and commitment of the staff working in the sector. Therefore, it is increasingly important to engage their training and development. Cooperation, dialogue, the exchange of ideas and good practices, studies and analysis are extremely useful to guide and support our national or regional approaches. And in this respect, we would like to thank UNESCO and the Uzbek authorities for organizing the World Conference on Early Childhood Care and Education. Thank you. Thank you, Romania. Uh, now I give the floor to the representative of Azerbaijan. Okay, uh, now uh, I give the floor to the representative from DPR Korea. Madam Chair, distinguished participants, it gives me a great pleasure to attend the World Conference on Early Childhood Care and Education and express my hope that this conference will become a successful gathering that would contribute to the development of childhood care and education. Children are regarded as kings and queens in our country where the national policy and system guarantee upbringing of children exclusively on state expenses right from their birth. The DPRK government adopted the law on nursing and upbringing of children on April 29, 1976, and thus legalized the upbringing of all children in nurseries and kindergartens at the expenses of the state and society. The best sites are always reserved for building nurseries and kindergartens in accordance with the principle of best things for the children. And the government is providing the children with all conditions necessary for bringing them up sound and healthy nutritionally, hygienically, scientifically, culturally, and emotionally. Institutions for ch child care and education are conducting activities to develop intellectual faculties of children in a way best fit for their psychological characteristics with emphasis on songs and dances, 
various games and storytelling according to the curriculum based on the standards of growth and development at different age groups. At higher grade of kindergarten, in particular, quality education is provided to all children in a planned way by introducing modern pedagogical techniques and means, including the AI, as required by the evolving reality, so that the children are well equipped with basic knowledge and ready for school education. The DPRK government is taking full responsibility to make sure that the children without parents are taken care of either in baby homes or in children's homes, while the preschool children with disabilities are nursed and brought up in nurseries, kindergartens, or special rehabilitation centers to make them adapt to their later school life. The third plenary meeting of the eighth Congress of the Workers' Party of Korea was held under the guidance of respected comrade Kim Jong-un, President of the State Affairs of the DPRK, on June 15, 2021. In this meeting, it was established as a state policy to provide nutritional food such as dairy products free of charge to all children in nurseries and kindergartens during the most important period of life for their growth and development. In our country, children are given new school uniforms and stationery on a regular basis and at the state expenses, regardless of favorable and unfavorable circumstances. Sustained and developmental changes are taking place in the work for improved conditions for education. All these, uh, all these achievements are the brilliant fruition of the love for the future posterity dedicated by the government of the DPRK. The DPRK government will actively keep pace with global efforts for continuous improvement of the quality of ECCE for the guarantee of inclusive, equitable quality education for all children and for the attainment of SDG 4.2. Convinced that this conference will serve as a meaningful event which provides a platform for exchange of experiences and contribute to ECCE, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks once again to UNESCO and to the government of Uzbekistan for organizing this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I give the floor to the representative of Yemen and um, to all the speakers, kindly ensure that you respect the time limit, please. Shukran, Syed Teresa. Shukur wa taqdeer li munazimat al-UNESCO wa kathalik nushkur wa naqadjir al-hukuma al-Uzbekistania ala karam al-diyafa wa al-istiqbal. Fi al-waqa' أن النهوض بمستوى التعليم مهمة ذات طابع شمولي تتطلب حشد كل الطاقات والإمكانيات في جميع المستويات وذلك من أجل القيام بمراجعة ضرورية وشاملة لعناصر العملية التعليمية التربوية وبما يتوائم مع المستجدات التي أحدثتها اليونسكو للتعليم المستدام والزامية التعليم والحديث عن الطفولة المبكرة في اليمن للأسف حديث ممزوج بالآلام ويكتنفه الكثير من المعاناة حيث يعيش قالبية أطفال اليمن ظروفا صحية وتعليمية واجتماعية بالقة الصعوبة نتيجة الحرب التي شهدتها البلاد منذ سبتمبر 2014 والتي ساهمت في استفحال معاناة الأطفال في بلد يعد الأقل نموا في المنطقة ويفتقر معظم سكانه للخدمات العامة وتمثل الفئة العمرية من واحد إلى ثمانية سنوات حوالي سبعة مليون نسمة من تعداد سكانه وعلى الرغم من التطورات التي شهدها قطاع التعليم في الآونة الأخيرة لكنها تبقى دون المستوى المطلوب فيما يتعلق بالطفولة المبكرة فلا تزال نسبة الالتحاق 
بالتحاق الأطفال بالتعليم ما قبل المدرسة متدنية للغاية إذ لا تتجاوز الواحد في المئة معظمهم في رياض الأطفال الأهلية والخاصة وفي المدن الحضرية فقط فضلا عن شحة الكوادر المتخصصة في مجال رعاية وتنمية الطفولة المبكرة وضعف كفاءة القوى العاملة في مجال التعليم ما قبل المدرسة ورعاية الطفولة المبكرة إضافة إلى تدني الوعي المجتمي ومفاهيم رعاية وتنمية الطفولة وبالتالي فإن أوضاع رعاية وتنمية الطفولة المبكرة في اليمن بحاجة ماسة إلى جبلة من التدخلات والمعالجات الملحة التي من شأنها تحسين رعاية الأطفال وتعليمهم من خلال المشروعات والبرامج التالية المشروع الأول هو مشروع تصميم مناهج الطفولة المبكرة بما يتواكب مع التطورات المتسارعة المشروع الثاني هو التوسع في البناء التحتية لمؤسسات التعليم ما قبل المدرسة المشروع الثالث إنشاء المركز الوطني لرعاية وتنمية الطفولة المبكرة المشروع الرابع بناء قدرات العاملين في مجال رعاية الأطفال وتعليمهم البرنامج الخامس مكافحة سوء التغذية وكذلك برنامج التوعية والتثقيف الغذائي شكراً Thank you. Uh, now I give the floor to the representative from Germany. Excellencies, dear colleagues from around the globe, ladies and gentlemen. Early childhood care and education are a fundamental building block in enabling a child's opportunities for development, integration and upward mobility. The destruction of ECCE facilities and other educational institutions in Ukraine is a catastrophe. We call upon Russia to put an end to its illegal war of aggression against the sovereign state of Ukraine. The daycare facility is the first educational institution in a child's life. It is essential to provide it with the environment necessary to safeguard the children's right to inclusive and equitable high quality education and care. Firstly, without sufficiently qualified and motivated education specialists, it is simply not possible to provide high quality education and care. In Germany, our goal is to ensure these specialists are allocated sufficient time to provide each child with high quality education and care. In this context, having a good staff to child ratio in every facility is an important stepping stone. As a key factor to recruit and retain child care specialists, we need to make the profession more appealing that means creating an attractive vocational training environment, promoting academic courses, endorsing ECCE research, as well as comprehensive development opportunities, and ensuring good working conditions with an adequate salary. It also involves increasing the incentives for men to take up work in early childhood care and education. In Germany, the federal government and the governments of our 16 lender or federal states, together with lo local authorities, are jointly responsible for the ECCE sector. While both the federal level and the lender shape the respective legal framework conditions for providing all, con um, for providing, uh, all children with good and fair opportunities, the lender, local authorities and daycare providers are responsible for the implementation and administration of ECCE according to the needs of the families on both the land and the local level. Through joint effort, all these players aim to provide high quality and inclusive early childhood care and education. Besides providing ECCE specialists with suitable working conditions, we identified several other key aspects necessary to increase the quality of early childhood care and education in Germany, namely to create service based on the needs of the families, to strengthen daycare center management, and to provide child-friendly spaces and healthy meals. Only if we succeed in offering high quality and inclusive ECCE nationwide will we be able to ensure that every child's physical and psychological needs are satisfied and that they develop into responsible and socially competent personalities. ECCE holds enormous potential regarding education for sustainable development. The child learns basic values and skills and it experiences that its actions have an impact on the other people as well at its own environment.
To tackle these tasks, secured state funding is crucial. We have to make the ECCE sector a political priority. It is indisputably pivotal to provide the necessary financial and structural backing in order to enable all children, irrespective of their social backgrounds, to receive high quality education and care, since the future of our societies is at stake. In Germany, we have already stepped up our efforts over the last 15 years. We established a child's universal right to a daycare place from the age of 12 months that allows for seamless transition from parental leave to daycare. This right also applies to children and families that flush, fled Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine and to other refugees. It requires a major effort from all actors, but it is an effort we are heartily ready to give. Additionally, we have improved access to child daycare by massively investing in the expansion of available ECCE places. From the experience of multilateral joint ventures like the OECD Teaching and Learning International Survey, we know that many of the countries present today face the same challenges in an increasingly faster changing world. Therefore, together with its partners worldwide, Germany seeks to promote the topic of education, including ECCE, as part of its multilateral development cooperation. We are looking forward to hearing the approaches your governments and key players decided to take on how to tackle those challenges. And we are grateful to the government of Uzbekistan and to UNESCO for organizing this wonderful conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, now we will have the representation from Tajikistan. Добрый день, уважаемые участники конференции. Я Саид Зода Раим Амро, министр образования и науки Республики Таджикистан. Искренне приветствую всех участников высокого панеля конференции. Желаю всем успехов и плодотворной работы. Уважаемые коллеги, признавая важный этап раннего детства для формирования полноценного человеческого развития и дальнейшей интеграции в жизненные процессы общества, включая образование, трудоустройство, создание семьи и воспитание будущего поколения, Республика Таджикистан сохраняет приверженность к вопросам создания благоприятных условий по обеспечению комплексного подхода к уходу, образованию и воспитанию детей раннего и дошкольного возраста. Твердо придерживаясь национальной политики в вопросах развития дошкольного образования, государственной структуры и международные партнеры – по развитию принимает участие в определении политики и принятии мер по налаживанию и удостоверению физических и социальных потребностей детей для их устойчивого развития и становления полноценными гражданами современного общества. Принимая во внимание приоритеты национальной стратегии развития сектора образования до 2030 года и реагируя на глобальные тенденции и вызовы в дошкольном образовании, правительство Республики Таджикистан – подтверждает свою приверженность. Обеспечивает условия для расширения охвата детей в дошкольном образовании с учетом физических, этнических, культурных, интеллектуальных особенностей и создания благоприятной, доступной и безопасной образовательной среды для предоставления качественных образовательных услуг. Наращивать потенциал и укреплять национальную систему подготовки и повышения квалификации работников в сфере дошкольного образования – а также уделять должное внимание по обеспечению возможностей для развития навыков и компетенций по родительскому уходу за детьми младшего возраста на дому посредством внедрения комплексного пакета социальных услуг, механизмов и мероприятий. Продолжить совершенствовать законодательную и нормативную базу в области дошкольного образования для создания благоприятных условий по привлечению и наращиванию инвестиций технических ресурсов и международного опыта в развитии дошкольного образования, а также обеспечить эффективное и целесообразное освоение государственных, частных и донорских финансовых средств для обеспечения устойчивого и динамичного развития в сфере дошкольного образования, создавать условия для внедрения и продвижения национальных малозатратных альтернативных решений, предоставления услуг дошкольного образования – посредством изучения и приобретения международного подхода, а также принимая технологии 
и расширения цифрового образования в рамках национальной концепции по развитию цифрового образования в Республике Таджикистан до 2042 года. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, the last member state uh, delegate for this discussion is the representative of Sri Lanka. Chairperson, Excellencies and Delegates. Sri Lanka wish to convey its deep appreciation for the government of Uzbekistan for the excellent arrangement made to help the World Conference on Early Childhood. Can education together with UNESCO. As a policy makers, it's our responsibility to maintain the quality of preschool children because the children's first experience in their life is preschool. So preschool is very important in this country. Finally, Sri Lanka join with other members in referring the right of every child in this world. Receive care and education from the birth and assuring that no child is behind in this world. We care for the children. We always have to care for the children. Thank you so much. I am Geeta Kumara Singh, State Minister of Women and Children's Affairs. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your very rich interventions. Um, I'd like to thank Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, and dear participants for the rich discussions we had today. Uh, thank you for your valuable contributions. I'm now closing this session and invite you to enjoy a very well-deserved break before starting again the next high-level session today in this room at 5 p.m. on the topic of policy governance and finance. And that session will be chaired by the Honorable Education Minister of Gabon. Thank you. <laughs>